It is a great day to be in the house of the Lord. We're glad that you're here, glad that we can open up God's word. And we do need to pray for those people that live in countries where they don't even have a Bible. Today we're going to be examining God's word in the epistle of Paul to the Christians who were in Ephesus. We'll be in chapter 5. And uh, we'll be looking at the beginning part of verse 18. That'll be our focus this morning. Uh, I'm very, very, very familiar, uh, as is every seminarian who went to the seminary that I went to, because in the first day of a hermeneutics class, the professor said, I want you to come back tomorrow with 75 observations that you have seen and are sure of from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. That's why we're only doing it a half today and a half next week. But I thought, what? 75 observations from a verse of the Bible? Are you kidding me? I was a, a pretty young Christian when I went to seminary. There were some older Christians there who said, yeah, 75, so what? Yeah, we can get that. And I thought, wow. They didn't make them up. You had to, had to be valid observations. So today we're going to be examining uh, part of that same verse. And uh, next week it'll be a, a grand culmination. Uh, that you'll, you'll really appreciate that. Uh, we'll be in chapter 5, as I said, first part of verse 18. If I could, may I ask those of you that are healthy enough to go ahead and stand for the reading of God's infallible, inerrant, and holy word. Uh, we'll begin by reading at verse 1 of chapter 5, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and we'll continue through verse 18. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved us and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma, but sexual, sexual immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints, nor filthiness and foolish talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty, that no one sexually immoral or impure or greedy who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the world. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of that light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord, and do not participate in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Therefore... Look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. On account of this, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Thus far are the words of today's Holy Scripture. You may be seated. And let me remind you of Isaiah's famous words. In his letter to us, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God, that will stand forever. The gospel writers captured Jesus' exact words when he said to them, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let's go to that great God in prayer now, shall we? Dear God, I do pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be found to be acceptable in your sight because indeed, Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. So God, speak to us clearly today. 
uh, give us areas in our lives which we can draw in greater accord with your will. Lord, allow us to leave here today uh, knowing that we are Christians desiring to be better Christians. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, two weeks ago, we spoke about genuine believers in Christ uh, being people of the light. Uh, these are folks like today who had noticed a gift from God through grace. They had received this. They had not uh, schemed to try to find a way. It was God who found them. Through no action of their own, they one day heard. They heard. They really, really heard the message of God's gospel. They awoke, so to speak. They heard and understood God's word. These same people had their eyes opened by God, and they began to see. Their lives were turned around forever. They became people who were being changed by God on a continual basis, and his word. They were being changed by God and his word into entirely new people. They now march to the beat of a different drummer. Last week we spoke about being people of the Bible and seeing and hearing God's will revealed through his word. Paul's exhortation was that we were not to be stupid, but rather understand what the will of the Lord is. It is that we should be, and I had six S's for you to ponder. It is that we should be saved and spirit-filled, sanctified, submissive, suffering for his sake, and saying thanks to all around us. This Lord's Day, Paul has us examining wine and contrasts it with the filling of the Spirit, which we'll cover next Lord's Day. For today, we'll examine just the first portion of 518. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation but be filled with the Spirit. In 1842, Robert Murray McShane wrote this, Make the most to redeem the time. Buy up opportunities daily for God's glory and the good of others. Today, we're going to examine what Scripture says about what is the way that we are to live and walk as Christians. So first, Let's see what Scripture has to say about drunkenness. Uh, the biblical picture here, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, condemn drunkenness. You probably already knew that. I get that. Every single picture in the Bible that's talking about drunkenness is a picture of sin and disaster. Noah became drunk and acted shamelessly. Uh, Lot's daughters caused him to get drunk and committed incest. Uh, looking further, there was a guy named Ben-Hadad, King Ben-Hadad, in uh, 1 Kings 20. He and his troops became drunk, and they were all slaughtered on the site except for Ben-Hadad. He was spared only because the opposing king, King Ahab, disobeyed God. Another example might be Belshazzar. That's in Daniel chapter 5, where Belshazzar held a drunken feast, and the, geese, the, the guests who were there, they praised the gods of wood and gold and silver and bronze. In the middle of the feast, uh, God caused uh, the kingdom to collapse. He yanked the kingdom out of Belshazzar's hands. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Corinthian Christians, and I put a small c into that because I don't believe that they could really be 
believers and still keep going on in this activity. The Corinthian believers were drunk at the celebration of the Lord's table. God caused some to become weak and sickly and others to die because of this wickedness. The book of Proverbs is replete with statements about admonitions toward staying away from drunkenness. In uh, Proverbs 23, uh, verse 19 to 21, Listen, my son, and be wise, and direct your heart in the way. Do not be with heavy drinkers of wine or with gluttonous eaters of meat, for the heavy drinker and the glutton will come to poverty, and drowsiness will clothe a man with rags. Just eight verses earlier, in verse 29 through 33, we encounter these words, Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? You know that, that phrase there, who has wounds without cause? They drank so much that they woke up with bruises and they probably rolled over in bed to their wives and said, where was I last night? What did I do? How did I get these bruises? Those who linger much over wine, those who go to taste mixed wine, and mixed wine is a higher percentage of alcohol, is an easy way to, to describe that. Don't look on the wine when it's red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent. That's called a hangover. And stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things. Your mind will utter perverse things. Lastly, in Proverbs 20, verse 1, pretty famous verse, wine is a mocker, strong drink, a brawler. And whoever is intoxicated by it is not wise. Remember, one of the qualities that we're talking about in this particular chapter is wise. He, Jesus, not Jesus, but God himself is, is saying through Paul, let's be wise, let's not be stupid. Let's be wise. And, and why wouldn't we opt for that? I don't know. I know we don't. Next, let's go ahead and, and, and peer a little more into the Greek and the Roman mythology that was afoot in Ephesus at this time. In Ephesus, drunkenness was associated with pagan or idolatrous rites. The uh, height of religious practices was to commune with the gods through some form of ecstasy. Heavy drinking and sexual orgies led to a sensual stupor, which in their perverted minds, they thought brought them closer to God or to the gods. Today, we have a little bit of this going on in the music industry, in the rock culture. They're kind of close to this. Uh, Sometimes you, you, you might go to one of these and you would say, why don't they stop blinking the lights? You know, why, why does the music have to be so, so very loud? Why are people jumping off the stage into other people's arms? The lighting, the uh, repetitive uh, driving bass tone, uh, the, the near frenzy or hysteria. Plenty of religions taught about losing human consciousness in order to gain God consciousness. The, the, I, I had to study this to see if I could get this right, but the greatest God in, in their panoply was Zeus, and that's Jupiter in Roman mythology. Well, as the story goes here, Zeus caused Semele to become pregnant miraculously, and then he killed her. He incinerated her, but he took the child from her womb and sewed it into his thigh and bore that child full term. See, gods can do supernatural things like this, I guess. That child turned out to be Dionysius, who was destined to be the ruler of the earth. The Titans ruled the earth then, and when they heard Zeus's plan, they stole Dionysius, and killed him, and dismembered him. Zeus 
found Dionysius's heart. His heart. And he took it. Um, And he, uh, I can't remember what he did next, sorry. Uh, he, Dionysius later on became known as the wine god. And uh, in Latin, that's Bacchus. And that's where we get the term uh, Bacchanalia. And a Bacchanalia is a, is a wild orgy. And that's what was going on in Rome. In Ephesus, in Paul's day, this type of celebration was still there, still present. And they even had large basins of water, which were called vomitoriums, all around the temple. And you can guess what that was all about. Um, to say that this was a decadent culture is probably to minimize what actually was going on there. Now what I'd like to do is to ask um, seven important, maybe I can call them intoxicating questions uh, related to wine. Um, and, and I had a tough time where I was going to come down on this. Where was scripture in all this? And I think that's probably why we have a tough time today about knowing should we just move away from that completely or can I have my foot dabbling in that or, or what? Um, the first question that I, I had to talk about was, is, is the wine of today the same type of wine that's mentioned in the Bible? And actually, there's different types of alcohol that are mentioned in the Bible. I assume it's different percentage of alcohol, but uh, the one that was in Proverbs 20, verse 1, is shekar, uh, Hebrew word shekar. It means strong drink. Um, so that's that's... Our whiskey today, our alcohol content is pretty high. Um, it might even be vodka or something like that that's even, even higher. Um, they had a, a new wine, which was sweet, and that was relatively high. And you'd like the name of this one. The name of this one was glucose. <laughs> so it must have been sweet. Um, and then the apostles at Pentecost in Acts uh, 2.13... That's a tirosh, and he's saying, no, they didn't, they didn't have any strong drink here. This isn't something like that. Um, the Greek word that's talked about most in Scripture, it's not generally intoxicating, but it's a syrup that gets mixed into it that, that raises the alcohol level. That's called oinos, and that's, that's the one that generally shows up in Scripture. Um, you would have had to drink a relatively large amount of oinos uh, to get drunk, and that's what those vomitoriums were about. Um, it, it required a lot. So this is why the phrase addicted to wine is para oinos, which means at or beside the wine, um, sitting beside the wine for an extended period of time is what they're talking about. In order to get drunk, you really had to go out of your way to get drunk with, with this stuff. But there was a stronger drink as well. You know, I, I, I always wondered, where did they come up with this plan, you know, to, to get vodka out of potatoes? Or, or gin out of, I don't know, what is it? It's an evergreen of some kind. Ju Juniper or Jupiter? <laughs> That's, who's the guy who'd thought that up? And, and what, what if he didn't get the mixture right? It was the guy that died. Oh, yeah, he tried three quarters, three to two. Don't, do, don't try three to two. Try something else. And they're giving their lives up for this. Naturally, fermenting wine is maybe 9 to 11% alcohol. And that might be in the unmixed category. The oinos is the mixed category. That could have been something like three to one. So that maybe it was close to what we would call near beer, you know, or something like that, where you have to drink a whole lot of it. 
So let me ask the seven questions to kind of guide our, our understanding of this, okay? And, and I'm doing that because I, do, I don't have the answers here. I, I think the Bible is a little bit gray here. So the first question we got to ask is, um, is it essential? Is it essential? Uh, in those days, it was a relatively safe drink. Um, my mother was French, and so we had a lot of alcohol around, a lot of wine around. And um, one day, really when I was brash, I said, Mom, why do you drink? And she said, you know, well, I, I'm not sure, you know. And, and I said, well, you know, it's every day. Uh, you know, that you're having some, you're having a cocktail and then another cocktail. And so why, why are you doing that? And she said, well, I'm, I'm not addicted to wine. I'm not addicted to drugs, you know. And I said, oh, well, why do you do it then? I like the way it makes me feel. That's what she said. I said, so you like the buzz. <laughs> That's what she said. She, she said, I don't, I don't like that. <laughs> don't accuse me of being an alcoholic. I just have one or two drinks a day. I wasn't anywhere near tactful. Uh, but I, I saw a lot of alcohol. And uh, for people who are raised in France, I understand that, you know, they just they put a glass of wine or a, a, a pitcher of wine on the table. Uh, and it, they treat it like water. And um, all I know is like the wine that we have, I probably couldn't do that over a protracted period of time without getting a buzz. Um, I do know that some good evangelistic opportunities occur when we drink. Um, and by that I mean somebody uh, professes to become Christ and then they go to Joe's Bar and Grill and they say, uh, you know, what, what are you going to do with your eternity? And uh, so with those people there, they, they kind of get drunk altogether. And the person who's made the profession of faith thinks that he's done something great for evangelism. Now, let me just tell you, that was me. When I made a profession of faith, that wasn't really a profession of faith. And I thought, well, I've got to get these guys saved in the bar. And what I did was I got drunk with them each time. Later on, though, I had uh, a session of men, uh, elders, in our church in Florida and uh, we had two guys that were um, pretty high-level executives, and the same pattern came up. Mr. Big was going to come to their territory and uh, wanted to kind of take them out to eat, take them out to a show. Uh, and so first one man who belonged to a bank and was higher up in the bank, he went uh, with the, the Mr. Big and several other people, and Mr. Big wanted to go to a strip joint. And so my friend, the elder in the church, said, you know, I'm just going to stay here in the car and I'll wait. Don't, don't, don't even give it another thought. I'll just be glad to be here. And one by one, uh, after a while, the, the men came walking out of the strip club saying, you know, uh, Jim, we wanna, we'd rather be here with you. It was good testimony. Good testimony. Now, the other one was coincidentally also a banker named Ross. And, and Ross had the same experience. And uh, except uh, it was alcohol went around first and, and he could see that the way that was going uh, that evening. And he said, you know, I'm going to go, I'll just go out to the car and wait for you guys. Now, the, the odd thing about all this, and I, it shouldn't be odd at all. Both of those guys were promoted and promoted. Boy, you know, my teaching right out of the Bible looked really good at that point. Out of way, guys, out of way. Um, I know there are people who get fired, you know, because they don't fit in also. But in our case, uh, it worked out wonderfully for those two families. Let's, uh, let's ask another question. Would it be considered as a wise option? <clears throat> Is that something that I should think about with regard to alcohol? It's a, it's a, it's a wise option. It's not forbidden. Uh, let me point out a couple of things. Neither is hang gliding. Okay. Uh, but it's dangerous, isn't it? It's, it's awfully dangerous. Uh, crocheting. 
It's not, is it considered a wise option sometimes? I would say, yeah, sure it is. I have had my, my uh, sweaters darned by Jean Good whenever the moths get to them. And I would not want her to be out of that business. I would be holier, yes. <laughs> well, this, this group over here didn't get anything. You guys got it all. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, what about injecting drugs into your system? This probably would not be considered wise, would it? What if you were a diabetic? Then it would be wise. Uh, but is it, is it prudent? Is it wise? Uh, God's leaders from Aaron on down were to refrain from intoxicants. Uh, Nazarites took vows to refrain. Samson, refrain. Samuel, refrain. John the Baptist, refrain. In Jeremiah's day, there was a clan of people called the Rechabites, and they refrained from wine completely. In Luke 1.15, we're told that John the Baptist was not to have any oinos, any of the, of the mixed, or any sakara, any strong drink. In Jesus Christ, really every believer is to be a Nazarite, set apart in his or her daily lifestyle. Incidentally, in, in 1 Timothy 5.23, where Paul tells Timothy to, have a little wine. Uh, he tells him to have a little wine for medicinal purposes, really. He's maybe fasting, uh, Timothy, maybe he's fasting, and uh, it's causing him some great stomach problems, and Paul was really imploring him to partake of this for his health. Well, another question we can ask is, has it been known to be habit-forming? What do you think? That's a no-brainer. God says to us, we are to form habits. Uh, it's supposed to be good habits is what we form. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6.12 says that we are not to be mastered by anything. Today, alcohol and drug addictions are overpowering dependencies. It clouds the brain. It endangers the body. So we can ask, is it in any way destructive? Well, you know, if you are drunken for years on end, our bodily organs collapse. And certainly that's what cirrhosis of the liver is all about. Uh, drinking to that level makes you contentious by and large. It either makes you go into a corner and not talk to anybody, or it makes you garrulous, warlike. Uh, the word dissipation is asotia. Uh, the word sot comes from there. When somebody's an old drinker, they're an old sot. And this asotia means that which is unable to be saved is a addict who's at that point. Drinking or the taking of intoxicants is self-destructive. Um, fifth, could it be a stumbling block for others? What about younger Christians who might be recovering alcoholics or recovering uh, drug users? Now, I'm getting kind of personal here, but I would say never offer anyone in your home or in your business any alcohol. I would say avoid as much as you can to drink alcohol in public at all because you don't know who else is there because you don't know what their spiritual condition is at the time and because you're probably an older Christian than they are. Um, Romans 14, 15 says that we have no right to destroy with our food or our drink 
him for whom Christ died. And five verses earlier, and still in Romans 14, don't tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. Now, I'm not talking about an older Christian. I'm talking about a younger Christian. Uh, number six, could it in any way harm my Christian testimony? I don't even have to ask you what your answer might be. You may think, like I thought, that it enhances your witness among non-Christians. But I can assure you that it probably dumbs down godly living. Even in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says that they should refuse to eat at a pagan host's home so that you will not offend that lesser brother. Lastly, at number seven, ask yourself, is it right? I can't answer that for you. Perhaps um, we can have a conversation with ourselves asking this question, is it right? Is it, is it wrong to have a, a beer with the boys? Uh, what do you think about? Scripture is, is asking you to think about it. What do you think about? Uh, are you bothered in that situation? Do you like being bothered in that situation? How would you stop being bothered? Uh, in 1983, we lived in Los Angeles in that area, and uh, the headline that day was, Glad I Got Caught, the actor says. Subline, Dreyfus admits to drug possession. The text said, uh, Richard Dreyfus, winner of an Academy Award, was charged with possession of cocaine after crashing his car. Quote, without getting theological, God turned over my car so that I would stop and talk to him for a minute. When discussing the difference between he and deceased actor John Bellucci, who overdosed in a Hollywood hotel bungalow, Dreyfus said that he was simply lucky. Quote, some people are not lucky enough to bottom out correctly, he said. Quote, there is a tremendous fear that drives us and pain that we are afraid to face. And it is very rare that one has the courage or desperation or a moment of stillness that is necessary to take the chance that what you're doing is not right. And he's telling us, I, I finally woke up and I was lucky. Um, again, I, I can't speak into your lives about whether it bothers you or not. Um, I assure you that um, I'm not going to hold it against you one way or the other. Um, Robert Murray McShane again. He, he was... 27 years old when he wrote this. Uh, these were words of encouragement to a newly ordained missionary and a friend. Uh, McShane said, How diligently the cavalry officer keeps his saber clean and sharp. Every stain he rubs off with the greatest care. Remember, you are God's sword, his instrument. I trust a chosen vessel unto him to bear his name. In great measure, according to the purity and perfections of the instrument, will be the success. It is not great talents God blesses so much as great likeness to Jesus. A dedicated Christian is a devastating weapon in the hand of God. As a, as a young genuine Christian, um, I brought a habit of smoking into my Christianity. And um, I can remember somebody saying to me, did Jesus smoke? 
I thought, no, that's stupid. No, he didn't. And then I walked back. I was living on a boat. I walked back to the boat and I thought, I have no picture of Jesus smoking anything. I ought to try for that. I had tried to give up smoking for a long time. But it was that time that that was it. He gave me the strength to walk away. What I'm going to do now is to, to pray and then lead you in a celebration of the Lord's table. We have a lot to remember, a lot to give thanks for. And we can bring that uh, to this focus that uh, were it not for Jesus coming to earth to die for our sins, we would have no hope. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you, and thank you again that you looked so kindly upon us as to shed your grace upon us to open our eyes so that we might see truth from your word. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.